Good morning, story lovers, and welcome to another episode of Around the World in 40 Tales. My name is Doreen Vanderstoop, and I'm here with my fellow storytelling Alberta member, Gordon Churchill. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great to have you with us today. So Gordon is going to be sharing a story that takes us from Iola, Kansas to Alberta, and the story is called The Magpie That Gathered Culture. Now, before we proceed, I would like to tell everyone a little bit more about you, Gord. So okay. Gordon Churchill is a storyteller, a woodworker, and a retired minister. He began storytelling while working in the United Church as a clergy person, and he expanded this pursuit by exploring his family history and joining Storytelling Alberta. He has told many kinds of stories in multiple venues. He has also told stories at Story Slam Calgary and The Moth in New Orleans. He believes that stories are a meld of the intended storyline, the reactions of the audience, and the creativity of the moment, moment, even on a live stream like this one. So before we dive into Gordon's story, I just want to acknowledge in the spirit of reconciliation and respect that Storytelling Alberta operates on the traditional territories of the Indigenous signatories to Treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10. And that includes the Métis Nation of Alberta and the Métis Settlements. Warden, please take it away. Thank you. The Magpie That Gathered Culture. Not everybody who's listening to this story will know what a magpie is, so I should start there. A magpie is a bird that we have here in Alberta. It's, oh, I'd say nine to 12 inches in length black and white in color with an iridescent blue on the tail. And it is a curious bird. I have two magpies that are <clears throat> right now trying to build a nest in a spruce tree in the back of my house. And they are making a god awful racket. And as they do, they are going all around my yard and picking things up because magpies are curious and they love to gather pretty and beautiful things things that interest them, things that I think are curious. If you were to leave your wedding ring on the patio table because you didn't want to get dirt in it, the best place to look for it, if you couldn't find it, is the local magpie nest. All kinds of things in there. Now, the fellow I want to tell you about first in this story is a fellow by the name of Robert Gard. And Robert Gard is, I think, a magpie. I want to tell you why. Robert Gard was born in Iola, Kansas in 1910, and he was born to a lawyer and his wife, and you would expect that Robert would grow up and follow in his father's footsteps and become a lawyer. And he might have, if life hadn't intervened in his life and sent him down a different road. Because in October 1929, when Robert was 19 years of age, the economy of the Western world stopped and there was no money. And Robert had no opportunities to go forward, go to university, do all those things. But he remembered something that his father had told him. His father must have been a somewhat unusual lawyer to say this kind of thing. His father said to him one day, where tillage grows, culture flourishes. Robert remembered that. And so he went out to ride the rods and to live in the hobo camps. And of course, in a world that's cracked open like that, people's lives crack open and they share stories and they share songs. And Robert learned a lot. When he finally did come home, he went to the University of Kansas at Kansas, and he did not study law. He studied playwriting. He fell under the spell of a man he called his professor, a man by the name of David Stevens. I'm sure Robert had other professors, and David Stevens had other students, but they had a very close relationship. Stevens said, Unless all the stories of all the people are cherished and kept and told, democracy is not secure. And Robert took that to heart. 
when he graduated from playwriting, David Stevens, who was on the Humanities and Arts Council of the Rockefeller Foundation, arranged for him to get a um, grant to go to New York State and set up playwriting festivals to teach playwriting, all the theater skills. And he did that for a while. I'm not exactly sure how long. But from that, he went to Cornell and did a master's also in playwriting. Life would have gone on with him writing plays and being part of the theater community, and everything would have been fine if, again, the world hadn't dumped on him in December 1941 when the Japanese Empire attacked Pearl Harbor. And of course, men of his age were ideal for military service. Now, I don't know that it's true, but I suspect that the Rockefeller Foundation thought he was too valuable to be a soldier, a foot soldier, and they arranged for him to have a job in Banff, Alberta, with the Extension Division of the University of Alberta, where for the summer he taught playwriting, and for the next three years he taught extension courses for the University of Alberta all over this province. While he was in Banff, he made very good friends with a fellow by the name of Walter Phillips. That name will come back and we'll come back to it. If you go to the Banff Center now, Walter J. Phillips Gallery is the main art gallery. And he did beautiful woodcuts and wood prints, just beautiful stuff. While Robert Gard was traveling all over Alberta, he became the magpie. Because every time he went into a community, he talked to people and he listened to people. And every time he found an interesting story, he tucked it away. And he tucked it away in a journal, which he published through the Rockefeller Foundation support called the Alberta Journal of Folklore and Local History. The archives of that are still in the University of Alberta today. In 1945, Robert was invited by the governor of Wisconsin to come to the University of Wisconsin and establish what the governor called the Wisconsin idea. And Robert Gard, along with a council of other people, began to set up playwriting, arts festivals, storytelling, all those things that enrich and deepen the culture of a place where people live. There is to this day still in Wisconsin, a foundation called the Robert E. Gard Foundation for storytelling, playwriting, dramatic arts. Now, we might just leave that there for a minute. But let's go on just a little bit more with Robert and say that he took everything out of that journal that he had collected for three years and he created a storyline kind of in the back of it and he published it in a book and he called it Johnny Chinook. That story book you find in a lot of libraries published in 1945 and the artwork by Walter Phillips is absolutely stunning clear, simple, direct images. Now, I grew up here in Alberta, and I was born in 1950. And in my growing up years, I was taught that Alberta really doesn't have culture and isn't interested in culture. We're just farmers and oil workers who want to get a, make lots of money and just we don't have time for culture. You wouldn't find Albertans going to a poetry festival or watching plays. Oh, God help you, an art gallery. But I want to argue with that. I talked with my aunt who uh, moved here with her family in 1918. Uh, her father had grown up in Ontario and was a carpenter. But when they came to Alberta, he became a farmer. And they farmed east of Lacombe. <clears throat> My aunt Gertrude, who died, I think, at 94, told me that they had moved into a sod house. And I said to my aunt Gertrude, that has got to be 
dark and depressing. How did you, how did you spend a whole winter in there? And she looked at me with utter amazement and she said, oh no, no, no. That was the most elegant house I've ever lived in. I said, how was it? What do you mean by that? She said, well, you understand that my father was a carpenter. So when we dug the soil out, we only dug half of the depth, which we piled up for the walls, three feet thick. And then my, fa my father built a wood wall around the outside. So it looked like a house. We had 18 inches of, of uh, cavity in, in the ceiling space that he insulated. And then he wood paneled the entire inside walls. So it was like a European castle. She said, my fondest memory in growing up is sitting in those big, deep, three foot deep window wells. The windows were three feet by five feet in the warm sun on a winter's day in the south. She said, it was the most magical place to read or to write poetry or to play games or to invent stories or all the things that we did all winter. She said, our parents taught us all these things. Now, this is a woman who, uh, in the mid-30s, went to the University of Al Alberta, took education, and became a school teacher. And in the school she taught in, she wrote poetry, she directed plays, she taught art. And at 92, she was still to be found in her nursing home reading the newspaper to everybody else because... She was a woman of culture. She had lots of culture. Now, the second thing I would remind you of is, I'm just looking here at my notes to, to make sure that I, I get this right. I came to Alberta in 1980. I got it, by the way, and I thank you. I came to Alberta in 1980. And I moved to uh, an area east of Calgary where I was a minister. And I was um, just returned from Eastern Canada. And I was very much of the Toronto prejudice that there is no culture in Alberta. So when I was invited to go to a 40th wedding anniversary for a couple down in the Gleeshan community, I fully expected that we'd show up for supper at six, We'd eat for an hour, there'd be two speeches, and then we'd all go home. I was not prepared to be coming home at 10.30, 11 o'clock at night because of the program. These were people who knew how to celebrate. There was a choir, a community choir, and they had been preparing for this for months. And they sang half a dozen popular songs songs that people knew, but they weren't the same words. They wrote their own words. So a song would begin uh, something like, love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and carriage. And then they went on and they wrote their own lines and it worked just fine. We'll meet again. I love you like a bushel and a peck. And then all kinds of some of them stories that uh, songs that they had written, both the music and the words for that captured and encapsulated the lives of these two people who were their very good friends. When that was done, there was a play. And the play, you know, some people would call it a skit. It was definitely scripted and there were costumes and it was the life of the couple whose 40th anniversary they were portraying. Now, it wasn't entirely truthful and it was a little bit rivaled in places, so much so that at one point in the play, Leroy, who was a man who never spoke in public, stood up and angrily shook his fist and said, that never happened. And the whole room burst into applause and laughter. It was exactly what they were waiting for. It was a warm, wonderful evening. And it was full of culture. 
these are the kinds of places where Robert Gard went when he collected culture. He talked to the people of this province. He went around in each community and he talked to important leaders. If you look in his book, you'll find the story of the lost lemon mine, but you'll see that he got that in a conversation from Senator Dan Riley. If you go read the books of Grant McEwen and then read this Robert Gard book, you're going to see that Grant McEwen lifted the words out of Robert Gard. And then he built his own framework around it. It's what all good artists do. They take someone else's work and they riff on it and they play with it and they add to it and they amend it. If you want to go back and take some of those stories out of Robert Gard's book, you're going to have to recontext those stories. When I told the story of the Lost Lemon Mine, uh, what was it, a couple of months ago, I had to build my own framework around where I heard the story. And I did my own edition of a piece of the story that, yeah, I made it up. But hey, that's what people with culture do. They play with things. I want you to know that this place where I live, this, this place that is, well, part of the heritage that is celebrating 40 years of storytelling is a place full of rich culture, full of people who love the arts. And we do it our way. Yeah, it's got our Alberta stamp on it. Would you be surprised it was any other way? There you go. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you for bringing us through history to bust that myth about Alberta. And I love how you brought your own family history into it too. That was awesome. Thank you so much for your gift today. Thank you. I just want to let everybody know that if they'd like to reach out to Gordon or anyone at Storytelling Alberta, you can contact us at info at storytellingalberta.com. And of course, check out our website and find all kinds of offerings for our 40th anniversary, lots of stories to listen to there. And that's at www.storytellingalberta.com. And of course, we'll be back next week with another story to tell. Thank you, Gord. Take care. Thank you.